Welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Jay Bishop, the principal of West Yaga High School. Tonight, we have a special presentation from Ravenwood Health on teen mental health and teenage suicide prevention. As many of you know, two weeks ago, we were deeply saddened by the loss of a great young man. We appreciate our parents' active role in your children's lives to address the social and emotional concerns of our young adults. We too keep a close eye on our students' social and emotional well being. If you've attended any of our new students or freshman orientations, you've likely heard me say that it is a goal of mine to see that every student who attends West Chicago High School does so with an open mind to learning. Unfortunately, as you know, when raising young men and women, that can be a challenging task, especially in today's world. Hopefully you leave tonight's presentation with something you previously did not know that can help you when working with your children or the young adults of the West Yaga community. In addition to answering the questions you asked when registering, you will be provided with informative facts about teen mental health, relevant information and resources to assist in working with young adults. Tomorrow, a form will be sent to all of our guests to collect feedback from this evening's presentation. Tonight's presentation will be made by Natalie Smith and Colleen Weatherwax. Natalie is currently a child and family program director at Ravenwood Health. She's been practicing clinical social work for over 20 years and has provided therapy to children and families who are facing a variety of mental health and addiction issues. She has worked in schools, outpatient therapy settings, home-based treatment and residential treatment facilities. She's an independently licensed social worker and is a certified trauma practitioner. Colleen Weatherwax is currently the coordinator of Ravenwood Health School Programming. She has been working for Ravenwood for over eight years in both residential care and intensive home-based family counseling. Colleen has worked directly with children and families who are facing a variety of mental health issues, as well as coordinated clinical care and programming for adolescents in residential treatment. She is an independently licensed social worker, certified trauma practitioner, and trained in trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. Thank you both for your time and expertise this evening. We appreciate you being here. Thank you so much, Jay. Uh, and we very much appreciate you inviting us to talk about such an important topic this evening. Tonight, we hope to educate you on suicide prevention, specifically with the teenage population. We hope to have an open dialogue. We hope to increase your knowledge about suicide. And we hope to encourage you to begin to feel comfortable with this difficult topic. We can go ahead and start the next slide, Jim. Just go ahead and start the presentation. <laughs> okay, so we are gonna start this presentation just by giving you some recent suicide demographics and trends in the state of Ohio. So what you see is in 2018, suicide was actually the 11th leading cause of death in Ohio among all ages, but specifically, among Ohioans age 10 to 14 years of age, suicide was the leading cause of death. And additionally, the second leading cause of death among Ohioans 15 to 34 years of age. What we know is that suicide accounted for 17.5% of all injury-related injury deaths in 2018 and was the second leading injury-related cause of death among Ohioans 15 years and older. So the data shows that truly from 2007 to 2018, suicide deaths did increase dramatically in the state of Ohio, 44.8% in fact. What we want you to hear is while those suicide trends are alarming, there is significant hope within Ohio because the Suicide Prevention Lifeline tells us that for every one person that died by suicide, 280 people seriously considered it, but did not follow through. 
So while we hope this training is focused on what are some of the, the myths, the risks, the warning signs, how are some of the ways that you can talk to your children about suicide, while it all might sound alarming, we want you to also hear the hope, healing, and help that comes out of this presentation. Because again, there is hope. And by you becoming educated about what to look for, we hope to empower you to have meaningful dialogues with your teens. Another thing, another statistic that we wanted to point out to you, this comes from the Centers for Disease Control um, in 2020. There was 13.3% of males did seriously consider suicide and 24.1% of high school males, females seriously considered suicide. Of those, 11.3% made a suicide plan, males, and 19.9% of females made a suicide plan, which then resulted in 6.6% .6 of males actually attempting suicide and 11% of females attempting suicide. That's a specific statistic for the high school population. But again, what we hope to talk about tonight is reducing the stigma about talking about suicide. It is often considered taboo to talk about suicide or to admit to having suicidal thoughts but we cannot stress enough that open discussion and awareness is needed to put those at risk of suicide on a path to safety. So we hope that through this education piece and gaining the knowledge and hopefully gaining again that level of comfort to be able to talk to your teens, that it will be time to erase the stigma of talking about suicide. So what is suicide? Really, what is suicide? I think what's important to point out is that suicide is not about wanting to die. Actually, at the end of the day, that's not what it's about, but it's rather about not wanting to live. It's hard to determine what we're running from and what we're running toward, right? And suicide is about escaping unbearable pain. And, and what we know about adolescents is that they feel things very intensely and very urgently. So sometimes they are trying to escape what they believe is unbearable pain, but we know is something that is much more passing. Um, suicide is a means to try and end a situation in which a person feels trapped. So again, not necessarily about wanting to die, but rather about not wanting to live and not knowing a way out. So now we're going to talk a little bit about what are the risk factors and what are the warning signs. Um, this first slide here is really about the risk factors, about what could, this is not an exhaustive list, but it is a good example of what could risk factors be that would, you know, create that thought in a child. So for these risk factors, previous suicide attempts, we know that that is something to watch out for if you have a child that has had previous suicide attempts and or if they have friends that have had serious suicide attempts. A history of substance abuse um, can create some of that impulsivity as well that could lead to an attempt. Physical disabilities or illness, um, and that's that also leads to pain and their pain tolerance and how much pain they could physically be in as well as mentally. If they're having relationship problems, both romantic relationships as well as their typical peer relationships, their access to harmful means, um, how easy is it for them to access something that could be potentially lethal? A recent death of a family member or the recent death of a close friend. Um, anyone that does know somebody that has completed suicide does increase that risk um, regardless of the way that they died. Mental health conditions, previous mental, existing mental health conditions, losing a friend or family member to suicide, as I said, um, not just, you know, any type of death, but especially losing somebody to suicide can create a larger risk factor. And then ongoing exposure to bullying behavior. I know oftentimes there's a lot of talk about bullying behavior and what is that and how does that impact a child? Um, it just goes to, to show, just continue to talk about it with your child as, as what is bullying and how are they able to cope with, to talk with and, and figure out how to handle that situation. Warning signs to look for. I know one of the questions that had been asked um, prior to this training starting 
was what are the warning signs um, that it used to be that parents would be looking for withdrawn behaviors, um, you know, just somebody who's becomes less interested in what they used to be interested in. And that now it seems like maybe it could be anything. So we did want to list some warning signs to look for, because while those are still warning signs that you should be aware of, there are a lot of other things to watch out for and be attentive to as well. These are feelings such as feeling worthless, you know, saying, I don't know what I'm doing here. I don't know how to help this situation feeling trapped, as Natalie had said earlier, that feeling of there's just no way out and, and not able to see the future. Alcohol and drug misuse, um, again, as said in a risk factor, that is a large thing to watch out for. Giving things away, um, it is paying attention to what are your children giving things away? You know, hoodies, clothing that they really like, jewelry that has always meant something for them um, to watch what they might be giving to friends or other family members feeling like they don't belong, engaging in risky behaviors, and that might not just be self-harming behaviors. It could be any type of risky behavior that would show that maybe, you know, they don't have a, a base of reality at this current time or really looking to, you know, try to find something that could be harmful in other ways. A history of suicidal behaviors, um, those could be attempts. It could be talking about it. It could also be self-harming. Um, no vision of the future. So that could look like, you know, a child that used to talk about after high school, this is what I'm going to do, or this is what I want to do after, you know, college. It could be, you know, they used to talk about plans on the weekends with their friends and what are they going to be doing? And then you notice that that type of talk starts to fade over time or drastically all of a sudden. Frequently talking about death, having lots of questions, you know, asking those types of things. That doesn't mean that asking questions about what happens after we die um, but it is paying attention to, are you noticing that talk is increasing from what your child's regular talk about it or questions would be? Dramatic changes in mood and behavior, positive or negative, which we will talk a little bit about more later, um, but that doesn't just mean that all of a sudden there's a negative drop in their behaviors or their mood. It could be that they go from being like whoever they are regularly to all of a sudden having a, a large upswing in their mood. Feeling like a burden to others, so noticing them saying more Frequently, you know, this, I can't believe what am I doing here? You know, I, I'm being too much. I don't want to worry my parents. I don't want to worry my friends. I don't want to worry my teachers. Um, possessing legal means, that goes back to the, the risk factor of is there access to, to lethal means? So I think it's watching out for how easily accessible are things that could be lethal. Aggressiveness and irritability. Um, if you notice that that increases as well and they become more irritable. Um, social isolation and feeling alone, and then feelings of hopelessness. We, um, other things to watch out for. So these are just some examples for you guys of verbal statements, because again, as we've said, it's, not, it's really about paying attention and looking for changes in your child's behaviors. But these are some statements just to give you an example of what you could be hearing. I'm tired of life and I just can't go on. My family would be better off without me. Who cares if I'm dead anyway? I just want out. I won't be around much longer. Pretty soon you won't have to worry about me. I hate my life, I want to go away. So again, these are things if you hear them, please don't be afraid to ask them more about what does that mean? Let's talk about it. I want to hear what you have to say. Don't just brush them off as things like, oh, it's fine, they'll feel better later. It's really something to pay attention to and ask questions. And now we want to continue to explore with you, what do you know about suicide? What are the most common myths about suicide? And then what are the facts about suicide? Myth, if a suicidal youth tells a friend that friend will access help. Well, really what we know is actually most young people do not tell an adult that they are thinking about completing suicide or attempting suicide. So this is actually where sometimes social media comes into play. What we know is that young people have at least recently, started to post things like this on social media, and potentially their peers believe that someone else is going to make the report 
right? They think someone else has seen the information. So young people tend to tell their friends more than they tell, tend to tell an adult. So it is okay to talk to your child about what types of conversations that they have had with their friends about suicide. Now, one of the questions that you asked, um, again, prior to the webinar starting was about what do we, how can we control social media? There are things now in, um, embedded in social media outlets that try to assess for suicide red flags and suicide risk factors. But it is something I encourage all of you to be involved with your child's social media use and continue to monitor it as you can. Myth or fact, people who threaten to complete suicide rarely do. This is a myth. Um, we, we must not dismiss a suicidal threat um, simply as an attention getting device. And what we really know about that is I know a lot of times we hear about, you know, attention seeking and that's what kids are saying or doing. Um, and it does seem like it's becoming more common that, that kids are threatening suicide. However, it is still rare that that does occur, even though it may seem as though it is increasing over time. So it is important that if you hear somebody saying or threatening about suicide, that you do give it the attention because it does mean, even if there isn't intent behind wanting to complete suicide, it does mean that they are in deep emotional pain. And for that, we should give that attention and we should speak to the child or person about it and really try to get more information about what's going on. So again, it does not mean that it's just attention seeking. We do need to pay attention to it and give it the attention that it needs. Just to even piggyback a little bit on what Colleen said, it still is extremely rare for an adolescent that is having an, you know, an extreme, extreme anger reaction to something. You, know, you as a parent wouldn't let them stay out past curfew something. It still is extremely rare for an adolescent to potentially threaten suicide as a result of that anger, that anger emotion. So that's where we want to focus on that and, and look at that more closely and ask more questions. But is it a myth or a fact that depression is the most basic predictor of suicide? Also something that is false. While depression is a high indicator, because if you truly have a level of clinical depression, suicidal thoughts or actions sometimes accompany depression. So while that could be a high indicator for suicide, the highest indicators are helplessness and hopelessness, that feeling of being trapped. Helplessness is when people feel that no matter what they do, their situation does not improve. So when your adolescent is talking to you, when your teen is talking to you, those are some of the things that you are looking for. Those are, that's some of the language that you're looking for. Um, it really could be anything, even in an anxiety realm. You know, one of the things that we've seen over time here at Ravenwood is the internet has everything on it, right? We all know that now. Um, you know, worked with a teen not too long ago who was just as worried about potentially not getting into the college of her choice based on being able to do so many Google reviews about how many extracurricular activities that particular college typically accepted of their incoming freshmen. So in that situation, she felt helpless that maybe she won't have enough extracurricular activities to put on her high school application. So your or college application. So you're really looking for those types of cues and indicators, not necessarily, although again, it is an indicator being isolated, being withdrawn, being depressed, being lonely. Those are indicators, but you're looking for, is it a helpless situation, a helplessness that a person feels like no matter what they do, their situation will not improve or a hopelessness that there will be no hope for improvement in their situation that could come with a devastating breakup from a, a romantic relationship, something like that. And what we talked about earlier on was what we know about adolescents is that they feel emotion, again, intensely and urgently. And the other thing that we know about adolescents is they feel as though they are the only people that have ever experienced that emotion ever before, right? And they also have that, that feeling of, well, it's never going to happen to me, right? So when it does happen to them, a breakup, a bullying episode, something like that, they could potentially feel helpless or hopeless about how their situation can improve over time. 
Myth or fact, more females than males try to kill themselves. This one is true. More females do attempt suicide. However, more males will complete suicide. Why? Because male, females tend to use less lethal means, such as pills or cutting, which will allow for the rescue factor. And by the rescue factor, we mean the amount of time that it takes, that it, it could take to find somebody or get access to somebody did and started the process. And so therefore, you have a little bit more time to get there and, and to rescue them. Males tend to use more lethal means such as guns and hanging, which do not allow for the rescue factor. So again, more females do attempt. However, more males are successful in completing suicide due to the means, which does go back to the risk factors um, to look out for in terms of lethal means and easy access to those means. Another thing that we is a myth or a fact is that talking to a person about suicide will put ideas into that person's head. This is hopefully a myth that we hope we dispel with this educational training tonight. It is highly unlikely that you will plant an idea into someone's head if you bring up the topic of suicide. If they have been thinking about it and you ask, it is likely to provide a great deal of relief to that person. Therefore, they don't have to verbalize it themselves. Trying to avoid the topic will likely be embarrassing to the person and they will begin to feel guilty that they are even having thoughts. So we really encourage people to openly use the term suicide. That is something that is very uncomfortable for people. And one of the things that we actually train new counselors, how do you become comfortable just saying the word and talking about it? Because as a counselor, when we're doing a clinical assessment, it's a very different question to ask someone, have you ever felt like hurting yourself versus have you ever felt like killing yourself? While I know those words sound harsh, they give us a different answer. And it's very important for us as the caregivers to reduce the stigma just straight off the, you know, straight out of the gate and say, let's talk about it. And I'll use the term so that you know I'm a safe person and you know I can handle it. I can handle those emotions and I'm ready for whatever conversation that we have. So really using the language doesn't put the idea in their head. And I'm gonna say pretty much regardless of how old they are. I would say really ages 10 and up, you could potentially use that term. Younger than that, potentially no. But it, it would not put the idea in their head. It's something that they've thought about. It. It's something that they've, they've learned about, they know about. And so it's easier just to be the safe zone. I'm going to use it so that you know I'm safe. Another myth or fact is people who think about completing su suicide usually give one or more warning about their intentions. That is true. Um, usually about four out of five people who complete suicide told at least one other person that they were thinking about it. Um, and so that goes really to, again, it, paying attention, listening for those risk factors, listening for those statements, and not being afraid to directly ask the question and say, is this something that you're thinking about? How can we help? Let's talk about it. Um, a lot of times it, it even goes to that, is it just attention seeking? And, and is it something that if we talk more about it, it will only make it more real and it will only bring something up that they feel like then, you know, it's getting that attention met. If they ask about it, if they tell you about it, you should ask about it back. Um, because again, four out of five people who do complete suicide have told at least one other person that they were thinking about it. They might not come out and directly say, I'm thinking about suicide, I'm thinking about killing myself but they do start to say those other sentences or similar things to it as we have addressed in the previous slides. Before I address the next myth or fact, I also wanna point out one thing that I'm realizing we might not have clarified earlier in the slides. Colleen and I keep using the phrase, um, an adolescent who completes suicide or someone who completes suicide. Just kind of wanted to point that out to you. One of the um, campaigns and efforts to reduce stigma has actually been taking the language committed suicide out of our lexicon. Um, it's just really about taking the criminality out of the behavior. 
And the old terminology of committing suicide indicated that there was a criminal aspect to it. And so therefore that potentially even reduced people's willingness to come forward. So we really have changed language over the years to say a person who completes suicide or a person who dies by suicide. So just wanted to kind of put that out there. I realized that we, we are using that phrase and I might not have clarified that as that's something that um, has changed and evolved over the years as we've become much better at addressing the stigma. So another myth, all acts of suicide are done on the spur of the moment with no planning. And that is also a myth. While some acts of suicide are done impulsively and something to be very cautious about is often under the influence of drugs or alcohol. So we know that adolescence is a time of experimentation with both, with both drugs and alcohol. However, despite what you might see or might, what you might think in popular media, the prevalence of marijuana use among adolescents is still relatively low. Serious marijuana use, the prevalence of serious alcohol use is still relatively low among adolescents. However, they are attempting at, at rates that are greater than we've seen before. So while some acts of suicide are done impulsively under the influence of drugs or alcohol, the majority of suicides are attempted after planning and discussing their thoughts with others. And that might be, again, whether posting something on social media and seeing what type of response you get, what, seeing what type of response people give them, or some type of planning the event. Myth or fact, once someone has decided on suicide, there is no way to prevent the tragedy from taking place. This is a myth. There is help available and it's important to intervene. Tell somebody and get help for that individual. A trained professional will be able to help an individual. Do not keep secrets. An angry friend is better than a dead friend. Um, that last sentence can come across a little strong. And, and I think it's important to, to recognize that and to say that it's okay. Um, you know, I do think that that goes back to saying it first and saying it directly and, and being that apparent with it and even helping your children understand because again, they have a lot of stuff going on in their lives. Peer relationships are difficult. Um, that, that an angry friend really is better than a dead friend. And as long as they're alive, you can help mend that relationship. Um, so we'd rather have somebody that's angry at us and then able to help them through that, then take the risk of saying nothing and then something happening. Um, Cause all too often, I think we hear from kids, well, don't tell somebody, like I told you about my friend, don't tell somebody cause they're gonna get mad at me or they, they were just kidding, they didn't mean it. And if you tell somebody their parent might get mad at them or this person will get mad, like don't tell them they won't ever trust me again. Um, and so I think it's even important as parents to be able to talk to your children about you know, we'll get through it together. And, and if they're angry with you, we'll help you through it. Um, but it is better that we tell somebody and get help because there is a way to stop a plan. There is a way to stop somebody who has decided on suicide as, as a means that we can intervene on. Um, and then this slide is really to explain, you know, the last two myths that Natalie and I talked about. Um, there are multiple steps that go into attempting and completing suicide. Um, it starts with having thoughts, and then they can move on to planning and preparing. Then that's usually when we start to hear the threats coming out, and they start to test that. And, and again, like Natalie said, kind of see what the response is and see and where that goes. And then we see the possible attempt and completion. So there are multiple stages in which we can intervene, in which we can look for, plan for, and try to be aware of. And when we're looking at the having thoughts and the planning and preparing stages, it really is, again, going back and listening to what they're saying, watching their behaviors and, and, and not being afraid to ask those questions. Because um, again, multiple stages and we can intervene if we get them the help that they need. Another myth or fact, when a suicidal person's depression improves and spirits lift, he or she is out of danger. So this is an interesting one. It is false that oftentimes a person's depression decreases and spirits lift once the person has made up their mind to complete suicide and they have their plan in place, almost as if a large burden has been lifted off them. But in any of those fa phases that we looked at in the previous slide, you know, having thoughts to planning and, and making a plan and then making threats, 
What we know is if we really intervene at any of those stages, again, I want to give you hope for healing and recovery. If we intervene at any of those stages, a crisis period only lasts 24 hours, 24 to 48 hours. If we do really good intervention and we catch some of that language and we have open dialogue and talk to our children, and we catch some of those, if they're having thoughts or if they're making a plan, that period of time after about 24 or 48 hours, and typically during that amount of time, what we do with the youth is make a very solid safety plan. And we look at all those risk factors and we look at those warning signs and we do everything we can to mitigate those risk factors. So we look at was the issue regarding, was there, was there helplessness or hopelessness regarding a peer relationship that they think went south? Well, you know, let's have some time where we spend some time wrapping other peers around the child for the evening. You know, how can we help them with getting close to this friend group or keeping connections, staying connected? We also look at um, reducing their means to access, right? So if they're going to have an impulsive decision, we want parents to often remove any weapons from their home, which could include knives, razors, anything like that. We ask parents to lock pills up. Let's restrict access to things. And usually if we've intervened with the teen in those early phases, that crisis lifts quickly. And they typically will be able to engage in therapy at that point or be able to engage in any of the social and emotional supports that are available to them. That could be church groups, that could be peer, other peers, mentors, teachers, guidance counselors, any of those kinds of things. Now that's something that we have to monitor and we have to watch for. But, but the myth that sometimes a suicidal person's depression improves and spirits lift, they're out of danger. It could be, it could be a myth because sometimes if they have not talked to anyone about it, if they've made their mind up to complete suicide, sometimes that last stage, they're almost as if a burden has been lifted from them. So how should we talk to our kids about suicide? What should you say, right? Here's the part of the presentation where we give you hopefully really you know, direct knowledge or direct examples of what can you say to your child at any age. What about even preschool through kindergarten? What if they happen to learn about something, hear about something, you know, hear about another student death, something along those lines, or something in their, in their friend group, a family member, they could have had, you know, their uncle could have died by suicide, something like that. In this age group, you really want to keep it simple and you really want to stick to the basics. Um, you, you could say something along these lines, this person died and it is really sad you know, they had a disease and, and the disease just took over. Just exactly like you would talk to your children if someone had died of cancer or any other type of significant illness. The most important thing that we wanna know in these early phases is follow the lead of the child. Gauge where they are, gauge where they are developmentally and cognitively. What makes you ask that right now? What made you think of that right now? What were we doing that you thought of that? You know, they might say, well, we were just eating macaroni and cheese and, you know, Uncle John ate macaroni and cheese last time we were together. Well, so you might not have to answer huge sweeping questions if you really follow the lead of your child. But if they do say something, I think these are some of the simple things. Keep it simple, stick to the basics. This person died just as if it was any other death. Now, what if your children are older, right? So these are our middle school age kids. If I'm an age, and we're gonna be more concrete with our middle school age children. We're gonna be more concrete with them. By middle school, one in three children have experienced some type of a mood dysregulation. And that means some type of a mood swing on either end of the spectrum that has scared them a little bit. They felt very anxious about something. They felt very sad about something. They felt very angry about something, whatever. So that does not mean, by the way, that does not mean that preteens will suddenly go on to experience a mental health issue of any kind. But it does tell us that even at this young age, even at the middle school age, children are very much grappling with complicated emotions. And they're very much trying to navigate their world at this age. They're trying to figure out how, how, what, what type of identity they have and how much they're going to you know, um, align with their peers. So this is a complicated age for, for this um, for 11 to 14 year olds. So you really wanna start the conversation with questions. 
And the best entryway is asking them, what have you heard? What have you, what have you heard about this person? What have you heard about suicide? What have you learned about it? What are your beliefs about it? By this time, they might have been introduced for some, with some basic suicide prevention and health class or something along those lines. So it's continuing to gauge the developmental and cognitive ability of your child, continuing to gather information from them that will allow you to be on the same page as their child, as your child. This might also give you the chance to correct any misinformation. So for example, if you ask your child, what have you heard about this person? And your child says back to you, well, what I heard today was weak people die by suicide. Then you can explain to your child, well, this person died of an illness, not because of weakness. You can really allow your child to tell you what information to give them. At this age, it is a recommendation to ask them if they've ever thought about it. If they come to you with questions about suicide or they know someone who has completed or attempted or they hear about it through their friends and they come to you looking for guidance and, and help, which they will, it is appropriate to say, have you ever thought of that? Is that something that any of your friends have ever thought about? Especially because as we said before, asking those clear questions, they know it's a safe place. Now here's the biggest difference when your children reach high school age. You're actually not going to ask if you've ever thought about it, you are going to ask when, when have they thought about it? Because parents of a high school student can have the exact same conversation with their teens as they would with the middle schoolers with one noticeable difference. And that's the one, because it's, it's hard pressed to say that a high schooler would not have a friend that has experienced some type of significant mood issue. It's kind of the same way when you're asking your child any types of questions. You know, you really don't want them to, if you ask if questions or why, why were you doing that? You're going to elicit the response, I don't know, right? That's the best response to the why question, I don't know. In this situation, we want to be very direct and explain to our children, you know, what would you do if you were worried about this and changing it to what would you do when you are worried about yourself or your friends? And parents can address this with teens as if they would talk about suicide with another adult, because actually that's what teens want to be addressed like an adult. So we're going to have an adult to adult conversation with our kids about this. It is also important in high school that parents reassure teens that having a mental health issue of any kind is perfectly normal and they should ask for help. One of the things that we know right now is that anxiety has become the number one diagnosed disorder in children and adolescents. So many teens nowadays are dealing with issues related to anxiety and that anxiety has resulted from the pressure of social media, from the pressure of doing well in, in their academics, their extracurricular activities, potentially their, their participation in their peer groups. Anxiety comes from a lot of different sources. And that is actually what we know is affecting our teens most these days. So, when you're, so it's, it's important to reassure teens that any, any issue is normal and it would be perfectly fine to ask for help, it would be perfectly fine to ask for any assistance for any of these things just like they would ask for assistance for any kind of a, of a medical condition. And when your child expresses a suicidal statement, such as, I want to kill myself, here's a perfect response. I love you so much and I would never want anything to happen to you. Let's talk about whatever's bothering you and I will help you. So instead of immediately dismissing the comment, like, oh, you don't mean that, you, you couldn't possibly mean that, right? We're really going to say to them, I love you. I would never want anything to happen to you. So even if you believe the suicidal comment, and here's one that Colleen and I hear frequently, even if you believe that the suicidal comment resulted from your teen, from you telling your teen no about a request they have made, 
one of the things that Colleen and I hear most frequently is they said they were going to kill themselves because I told them they couldn't have their phone after 11 o'clock. And what Colleen and I would say is we're not saying you should continue to allow them to have the phone at after 11 o'clock. That's not what we're looking for. But we are going to continue to tell you that, again, an extreme anger response to that request saying, if you make me give you my phone, I'm going to kill myself, is still unusual, even today. So if your child resorts to that as some extreme response to you setting a very typical and normal, reasonable limit, what we need to know is you taking that phone away really might have been a life or death situation to them. They might have felt helpless. They might have felt helpless. And we really want to use some active listening to find out why your child used that particular choice of words to let you know they were upset with your decision. And again, our advice would not be necessarily to change your decision. <laughs> our advice would be to really ask some questions about why is this so important to you? There are a lot of words on this slide, but we also thought since Colleen and I were aware that these slides would be available to you at other times and available for you to read through and look at, we thought it would be continuing to be helpful to give you some examples of what are some general guidelines. General guidelines are to take any suicide threat seriously and to talk about suicide openly. So if your child were to say to you, sometimes I think I'd be better off dead, but I'd never really kill myself. You might want to say, you'll feel better soon. It'll be okay. But what's a better pathway to get more information from your teen is to say, what is bothering you? It sounds like you're feeling pretty desperate right now or something along those lines. It sounds like you're feeling really hurt right now. It sounds like things are really troubling you. What's going on for you? And then again, I think about death a lot. It's real easy to go to, don't talk that way. You have so much to live for. But instead, you'll get more information by asking, how long have you felt like this? Have you ever thought about killing yourself? It's really important to continue to, to have these open dialogues, not being judgmental, not belittling their feelings. Um, sometimes when we intervene, when we're called to a school, so I put this one in, you know, a, a, a child might say, I just feel so embarrassed. You know, people are going to know you're here. They're going to, they're going to watch me to see if I do it again, you know, and, and again, I've actually been in situations where I've heard an authority figure say, oh, well, they'll probably, they probably are going to expect you to do that again. What did you expect? You know, but we really want to know what about that made you feel embarrassed and how can we help you through that? So these are just some things that we want to make sure we're not belittling any feelings, we're not encouraging self-pity, and we're not making any unrealistic promises or remarks. So again, and Colleen referenced it in one of her earlier slides, if the child encourages you to keep a secret, you know, my friend told me that if I told anyone this was going to happen, if I, please don't tell anyone that I'm telling you this, but it's really important. We want to not make unrealistic promises or remarks. We don't want to say, well, if you tell me, nothing's going to happen. No, we're going to say there are people available here. We can talk through this. I can find people that can help. And we're really going to help a person understand that it's just important to talk to somebody in the moment, not give them unrealistic expectations about what could happen on the other side of that. And then again, we, we don't want to slight anyone's feelings or opinions. You know, someone saying, I doubt any of the friends had anything to do with it. Really, it's asking, do you think your friends have anything to do with it? Tell you about friends issues, tell you about peer relationships, romantic relationships. So we do wanna to continue to elicit, again, hope that we, we hope that this language has given you some empowerment and some control to talk to your teens and really be able to, to better see some of the risk factors and the warning signs and to continue to ask for help. There is a lot of help available at WestG. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Bishop, who's going to give us some examples of what WestG is currently doing in this area. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, you know, over the last several years, we've been putting together a comprehensive program to address the social emotional learning supports 
of the students at West Jago High School. And uh, it is a, it's important to, to make sure that our families know that we are here to provide support for, for our parents, for our students. Uh, certainly, at any point in time, you feel it necessary to call me, uh, to call Mr. Cripple, our school's assistant principal, or either of our school's counselors, David Callahan or Sarah Whitman, uh, please certainly do so um, if you have any concerns about your child's well-being, uh, because these are things that we can uh, do in school oftentimes to provide supports throughout the day to ensure that, uh, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, to ensure that our kids, you know, come to school with an open mind that's ready for learning. And uh, with that, uh, just let you know, K-12, um, we've developed a lot of programs um, to assist in the social emotional learning supports. And I'll, I'll go over these quickly, uh, but if you'd like additional information or if there are specific ways you think that we can uh, help your individual child, please certainly reach out. But kindergarten through eighth grade, we have a second step program, which is an evidence-based and social emotional learning curriculum that's been implemented. Our middle school uses a connections classroom, uh, which is uh, also a curriculum to address social emotional concerns. Um, K through five, we uh, have very, uh, virtual parent support groups that meet. Um, I'm going to jump down to the high school and then I'll talk about K-12, but uh, West Jago High School, uh, we use, utilize a youth prevention, uh, youth-led prevention program um, to talk about uh, the different needs of our students, social emotional needs of our students, and our students actively participate in that, as well as restorative justice uh, program that our students participate in. Kindergarten through 12th grade, uh, we do have a district social worker. Uh, we also utilize a therapeutic behavioral uh, support person that's from Ravenwood Health, uh, a school counselor. We have school counselors in every building. Uh, we have training for our staff, uh, trauma resilience training for our staff, as well as suicide prevention. And we also have a care team that meets um, regularly to discuss student concerns. And we, we talk about ways in which we can uh, in, uh, support our students even further. Now, this is what I will say is a, a comprehensive program that we put together. However, it's always evolving. Uh, we certainly look to the needs of our students, look to the needs of our families, and we look for ways in which we can support um, all of you and all of our students in, in working uh, to provide a healthy environment for our students. So I do want to end, end the presentation with just some of the contact information about who you can contact if you are looking for help or support. Um, we did put Ravenwood Health's main phone number on here to contact if in fact you were looking for services. Um, there is a multitude of different types of services that Ravenwood can provide. Um, so again, their phone number is up there, the 440-285-3568. Um, and then for mental health emergencies, we did put down the COPE line. It's a 24-7 hotline that you can call day or night, 365 days. Um, and again, it is just a way, even if you have a concern, it doesn't have to be an emergency. Um, if you think you hear something or just have a question and want to run it by somebody and you're wondering, who could I call? Um, we did put the, the phone number for that there. It is 1-888-285-5665. Um, again, you will call, you will talk to somebody about what your concerns are, um, and they will be able to help and direct you from there with what is the next step. Um, again, we do always urge if it is an immediate situation where somebody is immediately in trouble that you can dial 911 and we would encourage you to do so. Um, but again, the COPE line is not just for emergencies. If you have any question and you're struggling to get a hold of somebody who might be able to answer that for you, please reach out. What's also not on this slide is a text line that I do want to at least say out loud. Um, you or, or your kids can text 741-741 um, and pretty much text it with anything, hello, hope, you know, anything that you want to. But if you text that number, which again is 741-741, um, you will get somebody as well. It is a texting crisis hotline. Um, so at this time, we do want to end the presentation and really thank West G for giving us the opportunity to present this. Um, as again, it is, we do hope that this has been helpful. Um, I think the fact that, that people are asking questions and really curious and open to learning is, is a good sign and that we can make a difference and we can, we can change things. Colleen and Allie, thank you so much uh, for your presentation, your extremely valuable presentation this evening. Uh, we will be sending out a feedback form, as I, as I stated earlier, to all of our participants 
uh, today and anybody else that's requesting a link for tonight's program. Uh, this will allow our participants to, I'm sorry, our, our, our viewers, our guests this evening to ask questions of us and then we can certainly get back to them. Um, and then always make sure you know that you can reach out to the school. Call me uh, again, call Mr. Cripple, send us an email if there's anything you're struggling with at home that you think that the school should be involved with or know about. Uh, thank you again for your time. Thank you to all of our guests tonight. Uh,